Hello, church. I'm happy to be with you today to share God's word with you. Our text for this week will be from Psalm 136. And so I will go ahead and read that aloud. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him, by understanding, made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever, and killed mighty kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his steadfast love endures forever. And a heritage to his servant, to Israel his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we have repeatedly read the phrase that your steadfast love endures forever. Lord, help us to reflect deeply on that phrase today. And Lord, help let that let our belief and trust that your steadfast love endures cause our own faith to endure during this difficult season in this difficult world. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. This past month, I must admit that for me as a pastor, there has been a difficult weight on my shoulders, maybe more so than normal. Uh, during the start of this COVID crisis, I really approached this as this is a season, this is a sprint, we have to get through this crisis. Uh, and really in this past month, it began to hit me that maybe this is a little bit more of a marathon than it is a sprint. Uh, it, it, things have taken longer uh, than I thought to get back to normal, and it seems like we're trending in France the wrong direction in terms of um, the, the COVID virus, and it is an overwhelming season uh, for lots of us. It seems like we, we've had a lot of sermons that, that have addressed the problems in the world at the moment, and it, and it continues because the problems in the world are still there. Bad things keep happening. Uh, for me, for for me personally, there, there's been these things have touched me, and I imagine this has been the same for you. Uh, we've had family members in and out of the hospital with COVID. Uh, we constantly see sort of divisiveness in the politics of the world. Uh, people, uh, there, there just seems to be no peace when you read the news. Uh, recently, I, I had a, a friend from seminary who went missing, and we and they ended up found, finding her uh, dead. Uh, there have been pastor friends 
who have been struggling through COVID decisions. Do you go back into the building? Do you not go back into the building? People who decided to go back into the building and got COVID, uh, you know, di- you know, congregations being really, really down because of it. We recently received word this week that the International Baptist Convention will not be meeting in person now. All of that's going to be online, which is a little sad for me as well because it was the going, uh, the sending off of Jimmy Martin, the general secretary, that we're not going to be able to do in person. Even this sermon that I'm preaching now, I was hoping this would be a more uplifting, we're back in the building now kind of sermon, uh, yet uh, it seems dangerous to go back into the building, so we're still meeting online. Um, and while the church in the park, and, and don't get me wrong, I love church in the park, um, but there is a desire for us all to be back together. Uh, and all of these things, uh, while we're excited about the parks, and, and, and I don't want to minimize that, it's the uncertainty of not knowing the future. What happens when it gets cold? What happens when, uh, you know, if, if things keep trending the wrong way? Um, there's so much uncertainty. And, and on top of this, there's all the normal things. Uh, normal everyday issues that are part of everyday life. There's people going through difficult times in church. Uh, we read the news and there's church leaders involved in scandals and people falling away from their faith. And, and it gets to be overwhelming. Uh, and, and the question, you know, if this is, this is not a sprint, this is, this is a marathon. Uh, this is 2020 has been, um, has been something that has been difficult. And we have to ask these questions primarily about endurance. And this has been something I've been thinking quite about, quite a bit about lately, because yes, it has required a lot of endurance on the part of all of our faith to get to the point where we are now in 2020. Yet if we look at the news and look at what's on the horizon, it doesn't seem to be slowing down. There is this a new normal? How long is this going to last? It's very hard to know what to believe because I think even even the people writing the news don't even know. I, I, there's so much about this virus and things that that's difficult to to reason through. The governments need our prayers more than ever right now because they're in the difficult situation of trying to protect people's health while at the same time trying to keep the economy from falling apart. There's people who have different monetary tr- struggles. At the same time, they're at risk uh, health-wise. And so there's all of this going on. How do we endure? One thing that was good for my heart in this past few uh, past month is a, a group of friends and I recently watched through the Lord of the Rings movies again. And that, I, like I said, that, that, is, that was really helpful to me. Uh, personally, and one of the things that I, I was reflecting on as I was watching The Lord of the Rings uh, and relating it to our current COVID crisis was the way that Tolkien uh, really portrays the hobbits in that story. The hobbits in that story, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it, Lord of the Rings is set in sort of a Middle Earth. It's kind of a make-believe wor- world where there's there's dwarves and there's elves and there's humans, and those three races are sort of powerful people. They have good armies, but there's another race called hobbits, and hobbits are very weak. They kind of live in their own corner of the world. The, their reputation is they don't go on adventures. They don't get involved. They're, they're weak people. They're small. Um, they're pretty naive, um, but the interesting thing is that in this story, uh, this kind of this epic, you know, good versus evil battle, uh, the hobbits actually are the heroes of the story. And one of the reasons, it's not because they're strong, they're the weakest of them all in, in, in the story. Uh, and they're not even, it's not even because they're sort of smart or wise. They're, there's a big naivete with them. A lot of times they do things that are unwise and not smart. But what makes them the heroes is that more than any other race, they endure. They they, they have this I'm not going to quit attitude. I'm not going to compromise with evil. I'm not going to give in to what the world is, the the bad things that are happening. I'm going to keep on until the task is over. This idea of endurance, uh, you you can really see it throughout their lives. And in fact, my my favorite character in the story is one of the hobbits named Samwise Gamgee. Uh, and he is, I really believe he's the ultimate hero in the story. There's, he, he, uh, he's sort of a loyal companion to the main character, Frodo, and he has to destroy the ring. Uh, but again, he's uncompromising. 
No matter how bad it gets, he's always there. And in in the movie, uh, it's played by it was a perfect casting for the movie. A guy named Sean Austin who who was in Rudy and uh, which was another role, role about endurance. But uh, he he was interviewed about his role as Sam in 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 the movie. He had never read Lord of the Rings before before he before he took you know the role and he, he said that as he was learning about the character he realized that this was a role in which he could be an ambassador for truth is what he said and he said he took the role very seriously he said because he knew what was at stake the idea of peace and the preservation of the natural world and it was clear that this character sam was an anchor in that he was uncompromising with evil uncompromising with what had to be done and endured no matter what evil was thrown at him. And this is a situation that I felt like I had to try to relate to during this COVID crisis as I was watching it. How can me, how, how can I as a pastor, how can we as a church, as Christians, how can we endure this difficult season where everything seems to be going so bad, when there's so much shadow that we must go through, when there's so much uncertainty about the future? In Psalm 136 that we just read, there's a refrain. There's a, re there's a phrase that is hammering into our souls. It's repeated. Boom, boom, boom. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Every prayer in this psalm is interceded by his love endures forever. And this, this call and refrain, this is a psalm that would have had this call and response nature to it. As a leader would have read it and there would have been perhaps a choir or the congregation who would have came in after the fact and added, his love endures forever. It would be hammered home. It would have been something that would have been remembered. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. It's something that had to be remembered. See, repetitiveness in the scripture is very important. It means that there's something very, very key that we need to make sure our hearts believe and rejoice in. It is, it is vital for our lives. His love, his steadfast love endures forever. As we approach this idea of our endurance, it is very key to understand the Lord's endurance. His steadfast love endures forever. Forever. There's no end to that. No matter what shadow we're going through, we know that we're going through the shadow with a love, possessing a love from the Lord that endures forever. Faith expressing itself through praise is vital for the perseverance of the saints. And this psalm is just that. Faith is underneath everything with this psalm. Faith is vital to it. Faith is what you, what you need to get through the present crisis is a faith that believes that his love endures forever. And expressing that faith through praise changes our hearts. Now, if we look at the psalm, we see you know, the, the, the praises that are offered. Uh, and the praises are pretty standard for, uh, praises that we see in the scriptures. Uh, it begins with sort of a call to praise in verses 1 through 3. We see that the Lord is good, that the Lord is the first among unequals. You, sometimes you hear the phrase first among equals. He's the first among unequals. In other words, he's give thanks to the God of gods and the Lord of lords. And this is not saying that there are sort of other small g gods that are legitimate. What this is saying is that God is over all things, that there is no one that can be compared to him. He all The greatest people, the greatest leaders, the greatest entities that have ever existed, he is high enthroned above them all. And so this call to praise and recognizing the power and strength of the Lord, as well as the goodness of the Lord, is the beginning of the praise here. And we see after that in the psalm, again, 
very common uh, reasons to praise the Lord. All right. We see in verses four through nine, for example, that they're praising God as creator. He alone does great wonders. By understanding made the heavens, spread out the earth among the waters. To him who made the great lights, the sun to rule over the day, the moon and stars to rule over the night. It's praising God as creator. And that is one of the key themes that we often see in the Psalms and ought to be a major part of the way we praise the Lord, which is one of the reasons why it's so great to, to praise the Lord in the parks. We're in the creation, and it's much easier to praise God for creation when we're looking at it. We can see the heavens above us and, and how, how expansive it is and how, how, how it seemingly infinite are the heavens. And that is from the Lord. We praise God as creator. In the next section in verses 10 through 16, we see another important category of praise. We see praising God as redeemer. And I, I hope you've noticed this. It's come up a few times this summer in, as we looked in the Psalms, how important the exodus is, the, the fact that God has delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt and led them into the promised land. And so we see in verses 10 through 16 that the psalmist is praising God as redeemer, as the one who led them out of slavery and provided for them in the wilderness. In verses 17 through 22, we see an emphasis on God's covenant faithfulness as the promise keeper, because he's, he's talking about how God is fighting the battles, and these battles, it talks about stri striking down great kings and Sihon and Og and all of these kings, uh, and he's doing that in faithfulness to the covenant, the covenant that he made with Abraham, that this land would be part of their inheritance, and how he's keeping his promises, and he's faithful to the covenant. And so we see God being praised as the covenant God, the promise keeper. And then we see at the end of the psalm, once again, how, how there's a more personal nature to it. See, in verse 23, uh, he's remembered us in our low estate. In verse 24, he rescued us from our foes. In verse 25, he gives food to all flesh. The God of heaven in verse 26, he, he, we're praising God as our provider, the God who remembers us, the one who remembers us at our weakest moments. He rescues us. He provides for us. There's a very personal nature to that praise. And so the praise is pretty standard praise. There are, there are obvious things that God deserves praise for, and it does our heart good to praise God for those things. And yet all of these praises are inter interjected with the phrase, his steadfast love endures forever. And I think that's such a key word for us to remember. His love endures in the midst of all the things that we're praising God for. Remembering that these praises are not something that are temporary. The, the, there's an eternal nature to this truth. The steadfast love of the Lord is not something that's here today and gone tomorrow. It's not something that we can, uh, that, that we'll, we can lose faith in because it's something that will endure forever. There is no virus that's going to stop the Lord's love from enduring there is no social injustice happening in this world that is going to thwart the Lord's love for us. It is something that endures forever. Forever. And it is in this call and response nature that we have a call to participate in that. Indeed, our faith needs to participate in that. This psalm, I think, invites us to put our own chorus and to add to the testimony of his love enduring forever. When you go to the parks today, I, 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 I would advise you today or tomorrow, whenever you're listening to this, I would advise you to, to do this together as a group. When you read the psalm together, do it in a call and response way. Pick a leader out and then have everyone echo his love endures forever. But even past that, maybe at the end of your time, 
I would encourage you to add your own ad lib praises. Now, I'm not saying we're not adding to the scripture, of course, but what I'm saying is add your own personal prayers and let everyone echo your prayer with his love endures forever. There are lots of times when we emphasize in our prayer the supplications and our needs, and that's very important. But it's also, you must recognize your heart needs to be thankful. Your heart needs to praise the Lord because it is an expression of the faith that says his love endures forever. And when I look at the world right now, even when I look at the church right now, I see a people who need strength to endure. It's hard right now. We need to believe that his love endures forever because it is in believing to the extent that you can believe you are your God's love for you is something everlasting that will never be taken away. To the extent that you can believe that, you can go through the present crisis with joy, peace, and confidence, with a faith that is solid. It's as solid as God is truthful. Knowledge of the endurance of the Lord's steadfast love for us is power for our own endurance. I want to show you an example of this, okay? And I, I don't want this to be just sort of a proof text of like, here, here's one verse in the Bible, and here's what it says about endurance. I, yeah, you know, the, all, all scripture is God's truth, but I want, to, I want to give you a more full example. And so I want us to go to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is going to be my example. We're going to quickly uh, look at the book of Philippians and how this relates to endurance. Because in the book of Philippians, of course, it's a book, it's a letter that's written by Paul to the church in Philippi, a church that he helped plant. Uh, he was in he actually got thrown in jail while he was in Philippi, but he planted this church. It's still there. And when he's writing this book of Philippians, he is going through some hard times. He, there's a lot of things that are going wrong that you, that could be, it could be seen as overwhelming. I know that uh, I feel overwhelmed right now in the current situation of the world. But if I look, if I tried to put myself in Paul's shoes, I, I must say he's got it even worse. Maybe first of all, Paul is in jail now. If you if you go with me to Philippians, if you if you're there in chapter one verse thirteen, it talks about how he's been. It's been known throughout the whole power, uh, imperial guard that his imprisonment is for Christ. So he is in jail, uh, and and that, of course, if you can imagine the weight of that, uh, many people, if they were thrown in jail, might might have a faith struggle with that. Not only that, but in, in just in a few verses later, in verses fifteen through seventeen. Paul gives a testimony of how some of his colleagues in the in the ministry, people, fellow missionaries who are out sharing the gospel, they are making themselves rivals to Paul. They, they're kind of undermining what he's saying, even though they're supposed to be sort of colleagues and helpful. They're, they're approaching it in sort of a divisive way. And if you've ever been in Christian ministry and you've been and you've had to do work with people who are kind of trying to you know, compete against you rather than be kingdom focused, you know that is a very heavy and weighty, difficult thing. But not only is he receiving that from kind of colleagues and, and fellow ministers, we also see that in the churches, uh, and, and specifically in, in, in Philippi as well, he's facing people that he calls opponents and dogs, right? In, 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 chapter, in, in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 28, for example, um, He's talking about not being frightened by your opponents, that, that they, are, they are kind of standing against the gospel. In chapter, three, verse, uh, in, in chapter 3, verse 2, it says, look out for the dogs, the evildoers. Uh, these are people who have gotten into the church, and so it's a, it's a difficult, it, it must be a, a, a source of worry. Because these are strong words, opponents, dogs, and the people bringing theological problems. And again, you, you may not think theological problems are a big issue, but theological problems can destroy people's faith. 
if you come and start telling destructive things about the Lord, if you start talking about a works-based salvation and how we're, you, you, we have to earn our way to God rather than his love endures forever, uh, you're, you're going to destroy the faith of many people who recognize that they haven't done anything to earn the favor of the Lord. You see, theological problems can be very, very serious, and that was threatening the church. It was threatening to destroy people's faith. We also see more problems in chapter 2, uh, verse 25 through 27. We know that Paul had had a difficult time in terms of resources. And so the Philippian church, who, who uh, was a very good church, sent a man named Epaphroditus to him to help him with the resource problem that he had. And Epaphroditus almost died, it said. And, and so Paul had this, he was rejoicing that he didn't die, but he had this, you know, difficult weight on his shoulder that he had, because of his needs, uh, a dear friend almost died. We see in chapter 4, verse 1, how he's separated from the church and how that, that there, there is a longing there. There's a missing there of being absent because he's in jail. He also talks about in verses 2 and 3, there's two women in the church that are in conflict with each other, seemingly over something that's not worth arguing about. He's saying, his response is just, is just agree with each other. Agree with each other, please. Don't cause conflict. Don't cause problems. Is this something that's really worth fighting about? And so there's all of these trials and difficult things going on. But here's what's very interesting about this book, Philippians. Because you might have concluded all these difficult things, all these hard times that, that Paul would have been going through as he writes this book, that it would affect his attitude, that it would hurt his faith. On the contrary, Philippians is known as an epistle of joy. You can almost see the excitedness and the happiness bursting out of this book in a way you don't see in, in, in many other books. Why? Why is he able to endure, and not only endure, but endure with peace and with joy, despite the fact that he is in prison, that his colleagues are putting themselves as, as, as rivals, there's dogs and opponents in the church, that one of his friends almost died in trying to help him, that he's separated from those he's loved, and that there's division in the church. How, how can he be joyful in this? Well, if you read the book, you can see there's constant joy because of his faith. And specifically, the content of his faith uh, is the power to endure. His steadfast love endures forever. Look at chapter 1, verse 6 of Philippians. This is a pretty, There's a lot of famous verses in, the, in this book. This is one of them. One of the fam most famous verses when we start talking about endurance and perseverance of the saints. He begins the book, thanking God in all my remembrance of you, every prayer I pray for you, I'm praying with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Again, an epistle of joy. In verse 6 it says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The God who began to work in you is going to complete it. Why? Because his steadfast love endures forever. You cannot make the steadfast love of the Lord stop enduring. It's his love, and it endures. And he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. And belief in that changes everything. It changes the way we read the news today. We see it going on, because look at how he interprets his circumstances as a result of this. Remember him being in jail? Remember talking about that? How would you interpret being in jail? Let me show you how Paul does. If you look in verse in chapter uh, 1, verses 12 through 14, it says this. I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word of God without fear. How does he, how does he respond to being in jail? He's thankful. He, he, I'm so glad I'm in jail because I've seen how it's advanced the gospel. 
I, the guards are coming to faith. People have been encouraged and people are being more bold in their witness now. He's thankful that he's in jail because it serves to advance the mission of God. How can you have that kind of confidence? Well, you have to be convinced that his steadfast love endures forever. We see the same thing as he gets into the next problem that was mentioned about people kind of preaching out of false motives, the colleagues that were putting themselves as rivals to the Lord. Look how he responds to that. Some indeed, in verse, verse 15 of chapter 1, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, others from goodwill. The latter do it in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel, but the former, those who are doing it uh, out of envy and rivalry, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, ambition not sincerely, but thinking to inflict, afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and that for this I rejoice. He's concerned about one thing, Christ being proclaimed. And he's rejoicing in his circumstances because his circumstances are producing Christ being proclaimed. Which leads him in the next part, that, that the very famous verse, that God is faithful to him, his belief that God is faithful to him, whether he lives or dies. That's what he says. Look at verse chapter 21, uh, verse 21. It says, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor to me. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your account. Whether he lives, whether he dies, he has peace and joy. Why? Because he believes that his steadfast love endures forever. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We can go on and on in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It is, he's following the example of Jesus in humility. Jesus who laid aside his life, right? Who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Paul is saying, I want to lay down my life in the same way. Just as Jesus was crucified, let me be so as well. Because following Jesus' example of humility is not weakness, it is an honor. It is an honor to follow Jesus in this way. Why can he do this? Why can he have joy in this kind of mindset? Because he believes that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. We see also his belief that he can endure anything in Christ's strength. He can, in, ver in chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, he can overcome his own past, his own sins, his own weaknesses. This is the chapter, chapter 3 of Philippians, where he talks about how everything before I counted as loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered all things. He he used to be a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrews, someone who persecuted the church. He said he counts all of that as rubbish compared to, to knowing Christ. And he says that he, you know, he's not a perfect person, he says in chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this, not that I've already been made perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus has made me his own. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. No matter how bad it gets, he endures. He presses on because he realizes that there is an end to the shadow. There is an end to the imprisonment. There is an end to the difficulties of this life. To live is Christ, but to die is gain because the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And this is why he says in the very famous, the, the, the verse you see on t-shirts and Christian coffee mugs all over the world, this is why he says in chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He says in that context, I've learned to live when I'm in need. 
I've learned to live when I have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you believe right now that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Do you look at this world and what's going on around you and feel overwhelmed? I, I, I admit I have. Uh, and what has done my heart good is believing that his love endures forever. That while we are going through a shadow of death, we will pass through it to an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. As I rewatch the Lord of the Rings, I often put myself in the shoes of those poor hobbits. <laughs> Everything seemed to be going wrong. Everything was over their head. Every enemy they faced was more powerful than them. Every problem seemed insur insurmountable. Yet their tenacity to not quit. Yes, the difficulties were too much for them, but that doesn't matter. They're not, they're not compromising with the darkness. They're not compromising with evil. And there's a famous, there's a famous uh, scene at the end of the second movie where Sam and Frodo are, Sam, Sam's giving a speech to Frodo because Frodo is on the verge of losing heart. He's, he's seeing everything's going wrong. The weight of carrying the ring uh, is getting to him. It's, it's hurting him. And everything seems to be going wrong. And Frodo, in this despair, says, I can't do this, Sam. And Sam says this, I know. It's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great Fro stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really matter. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. When the sun shines, it will shine out all the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think now, Mr. Frodo, I, I do think I understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back. Only they didn't. Because they were holding on to something. What were they holding on to, Sam, Frodo asked. That there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Church, there's some good in this world that is worth fighting for. And as difficult as these times are to endure, we mustn't forget that the Lord's steadfast love endures forever and endures for us. And with this love is a calling, a calling to be on mission for him while we are here because to live is Christ, to die is gain, but to live is Christ. And if we go on living in the body, it means fruitful labor. We have a good that is worth fighting for. And passing through the shadow should not cause us to quit. This past week, we posted a testimony video from church members on, on Facebook. And that was a, a tremendous encouragement to my own heart. Because what I see is a testimony of church members who see this good that is worth fighting for. Who are believing that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And they're being committed to our church. You see... The faith of your brothers and sisters in Christ that we're, we're committed to at EIC, their faith is worth fighting for. This is why it's important that even though you might consider it to be bad news that we haven't gone back to the building, it's important for you to make a renewed commitment to the parks. Because your church is worth fighting for. The faith of your brothers and sisters is worth fighting for. But not only of the church, but of the mission of the Lord. The lost need to hear the gospel. 
because the gospel is what changes us. If we want to be able to endure this crisis, where the world seems to be falling apart on every front, what we need, according to the scriptures, is faith that believes that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. That the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ loved us so much that he died on a cross for our sins, that he rose from the dead, that is the message that the world needs, that the church needs. And it is those of you who have faith that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever that are capable of fighting for this good. You see, the hobbits were the heroes because they didn't compromise with evil. No matter how hard it got, no matter how deep the shadow, no matter how many things went wrong, their faith was unwavering. This is what we are called to, church. An unwavering endurance. This is not a sprint, it's a marathon, but the marathon is doable. It's doable because the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. There's no end to it. No matter how long the marathon lasts, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And that is a great comfort during in these uncertain times. Because we don't know how long the marathon will be. We don't know how bad it will get. We just know that we have a faith in a God who is capable. Who's capable of enduring all. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Church, there's some good in this world. It's worth fighting for. Let us endure because the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Amen.